My name is Andre Murphy and I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked to do, host this evening and to do this interview. Just to let you know the format of tonight is a conversation with myself and Michelle and it'll last about an hour, a little bit more than an hour and there'll be a little bit of time afterwards for people to maybe get a quick photo with Michelle or whatever. So that's the format for tonight but we're going to bounce right in and Michelle. So 2005 you, you become an elected official, you become a councillor in Dungannon Council, you then become the first woman mayor of Dungannon, and then 2011, you're the Minister for Agriculture, 2016, the Minister for Health, but only for nine months. Pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're elected Vice President of Sinn Féin, you become the Deputy First Minister, and now you're the First Minister-elect. For, for all of us. It's so, some journey over a very short period of time. And I suppose this summer has been very special with the local election results. And we're going to jump straight in to talk about the significance of maybe the past just over a year of two enormous election results and what's happened. And even though it was a local election, it was very much conducted on a presidential style. So you were the face of Sinn Féin for that, for that uh, election. Tell us about those decisions that were made behind that, because that wasn't an accident, that was quite deliberate. Why did you choose to do that type of an election campaign this year? Well, great to be here um, this evening, just to say that for a start, and clearly we colour coordinated our wardrobe <laughs> you know, to make it all look better. Um, yeah, so it, it was a local government election, and it was to elect um, hard-working councillors that would have the back of the community that they serve. And we did that with, I'm very grateful for the public support that we got in the election. Um, 144 councillors um, were elected. But it was a different kind of campaign than we normally fight for a local government election. Um, and I think there was a couple of reasons for that. The main reason, I suppose, was that that election came hot on the heels of the Assembly election yes. previous, which was a very historic election um, for reasons which I'm sure we'll want to, to talk about. But because of that historic election, and because that result, the democratic outcome of that election, is yet to be respected, it was another opportunity for the public to come out and to say what they wanted, which I believe they voted for, you know, for making politics work, they voted for positive leadership, they voted to endorse the message which they did in the previous Assembly election, um, and it was to send a message, I suppose, to the DUP also, that they want the executive up and running, they want us working together. So. I think that's why, or that was the thinking behind the style of the election and the approach that we took. Um, it was a hugely positive election campaign. Mm. I mean, I thought last year's assembly election campaign was hugely positive, and the feedback on the doors from all the, you know, door wrapping that you do throughout a canvas. But that followed through into the council election, and you could just feel it. It was palpable, and people were rehearsing to all of our canvassers, all of our people in the doors, all of our activists that they thought this election was this opportunity to re-endorse last year's election right. and to send that message. That's really interesting. And I suppose the Assembly election coming as it did, you know, the, in the context of the DUP collapsing the Assembly, you know, you had been Deputy First Minister with a significant mandate really from Martin McGuinness in terms of nearly a change of approach to what had gone before. Could you talk us through a little bit about the previous assembly, that little bit of time that it was up, a very, very challenging time with the pandemic, um, multiple challenges, but also, you know, it was a very different type of government. It was. Um, I think whenever uh, we reflect on the institutions collapsing back in 2017, yeah. and they collapsed because Martin McGuinness had asked Darling Foster at that time to stand aside because of the RHI inquiry to allow for there to be you know, an independent investigation into what had happened, and she refused to do so. So then Martin had uh, made the choice to resign because there wasn't any other option on the table. But if you reflect back on his resignation letter from the time, he st st stated very clearly in the letter that the DUP had never embraced fully the, or at all the equality um, and mutual respect aspects of the Good Friday Agreement. <laughs> They hadn't embraced the North-South bodies in the way in which they should have. And he talked about in his letter about the shameful disrespect towards certain sections of our society and all things to do with Irish national identity. Mm. And I think whenever you reflect on that, I mean, that was, I mean, the man had a patience of a saint. I've said this before publicly, um, because of all the blockages that were continually thrown up on progressing, progressive issues, equality issues, and the DUP continuing to block those things. So I think for us as a party, we reflected on 
all of that time previously in the executive and we decided that we wanted to see a step change. We decided that yes. we would work to try to have the institutions restored because we believe in power sharing. And from 2017 to 2020, we worked our way through that. We had numerous negotiations. But if you remember at that time, the DUP were off playing footsie with the Tories, propping up the Tories mm. in a confidence and supply deal. And they weren't interested in restoring the executive at that time. But we did eventually get there uh, in 2020. Um, the new decade, new approach deal was struck. And we were straight into the executive and us with our new approach, our step change, as we described it, um, and I'll explain that a wee bit more in a minute, but we were very quickly hit with the pandemic. We're only a fledgling assembly and executive. Yeah. The pandemic hit, and all of our attentions were turned to try to, you know, to mine people as best we could through that, through that period. And I have to give credit to all the ministers from all the parties that are on the executive table, because people did try to work with unity of purpose. Not always possible, but, you know, we did try our best. And I think people genuinely felt enormous burden on us to be able to try to you know save lives and, and get us through the, the pandemic time. But as we started to come out of the pandemic we were returning to the you know the political priorities that we all had and it was very clear that the DUP were still in the mode of blocking issues and part of the step change for us was to change our approach. Previously we would have tried to resolve these things in the executive but that's not a public forum so people don't get to see that political exchange you know the debates yeah. that you're having. Um, and I decided that the best way for the executive to work is actually power sharing. and it is actually all the parties working together and that we needed to take the issues out from behind the executive closed door and put them into the assembly floor and have the, the debate, the political discourse that you have and then sometimes you're going to win and sometimes you're going to lose when you take that approach. But thankfully um, I'm very proud actually of what we were able to achieve in that short window that we had. Numerous pieces of legislation went, got over the line. And that was even despite the fact that the DUP walked away then in November of 2020. The, ex the executive wasn't sitting, but the assembly was sitting. Yes. And we were able to progress a number of big pieces of legislation. Dahi's Law, which you're all very familiar with, modernising organ donation, autism, um, improving autism services. There was a whole raft of things that we were able to get over the line. And that was despite opposition from um, the DUP. But to me, that was what was the game changer and the step change. It was working with all the other parties debunking the two big problem party narrative that was you know, sort of promoted by some um, and making politics work and showing the potential of power sharing and that's what I thought we saw, I hope that everybody saw in those sort of um, closing days of the assembly before um, we went to the assembly election. That's probably something that didn't get the public um, focus that it might have done, just that change and that approach, because sometimes there's a lazy narrative of two, power, of two parties that doesn't reflect that. But it also talks about skills that you probably don't see in the public domain as much. Um, if there's a step change in politics and what people see as the outcomes, is there a step change in terms of the skills that are used? Yeah, I, I suppose um, everybody's got their own skill set. Everybody brings something to the table. Uh, we're all not the same. That's a good thing. Um, and you have to play at everybody's strengths. I think that there was probably, maybe it's a, a female in leadership, and a, I know you want to talk a wee bit about that, but I think perhaps just that, that kind of collaboration, trying to quietly get things done, was kind of the approach, and I think that was kind of what was needed through that period to change the political circumstance in which we were all working. Um, so I see so much potential in an executive and an assembly if we can get back to that point again, and I mm. hope that we do. Um, but definitely it has to be in the tone of um, collaboration, working together. You get much, more, much, much more done in life when you work with others where you can. And that um, discussion around relationships is really interesting because at the same time that you're taking on this, uh, this role within the Assembly and in the North, Mary Lou MacDonald becomes the new president of Sinn Féin as well. And, you know, there's, it, it's almost easy to say, oh, it's two women, you must be best friends or whatever. But there must be something different about that. What's that relationship like? Oh, it's very positive. Um, really, really good relationship, both on a professional, political Form, but also in a personal way like we're like everybody else we like the banter we like to crack we can have a laugh at things um, but Jay I think we're a national leadership so it's really really important that we're very jailed and that we act nationally in everything that we do so there's always a challenge just with the two jurisdictions on the island yeah. you know Mary Lou is the leader of the opposition in the Dáil biting at the feet of the establishment parties to be the Irish government at the next election if the public get behind us 
Um, and I think that, and then I have this role if the executive was up and running, the role of first minister for, for everybody, for all. Um, and then we have just our national politics, so we constantly, like Mary Lou's the president, I am the deputy, um, and I have the utmost respect for her and her leadership role. Leadership's a difficult station. Um, mm. And it's just good that you have people that around you that you have a you know a good rapport with and a good relationship with it allows you to be more effective, I think, in, in what we do. But I think we're very joined up nationally, but at times and there's no partition in our leadership, but at times we live a different emphasis in terms of the things that we have to focus on, whether that be the opposition or whether that be in the assembly. And the other challenge for us obviously as a party is always going to be if you know, leader of the opposition is, is one role, but when it comes to the national question and it comes to national um, issues, then it's important that we have a strong relationship with the Irish government. Yes. Um, so you have to make the distinction and separate the two things out. Sometimes easier said than done. Yeah, that must be a tension, actually, you know, when you're trying to find a, a comprehensive approach from Irish nationalism, Sinn Féin and the Irish government working together, and then you're walking into Leinster House, as you say, biting at the toes. That can't be easy. No, it, it can be difficult, and sometimes it's hard for people to take off one hat to yeah. put on another. Um, and we've had that exchange at different times with different <laughs> Irish government ministers. But um, that's really, really important that, that's, that we try to maintain that. Um, because there's the cut and thrust, the day to day, and that's just what we do. But alongside that, we have to be very conscious that we need to work together on the national question. That's really interesting. Um, and there's something about women and leadership positions and the change that that brings about as well. You know, so um, I think we can see nearly there's a bit. There has been a big change of the complexion of power regionally in terms of gender. There has, um, and I think that I mean our party now, um, coming from, you know, Jerry and Martin, Jerry who's here, and four decades of leadership, and how grateful are we for, for all of that? But in a very different political climate, in a very different context. But you know, two men that had the vision to see beyond conflict and to open up this, you know, pathway, uh, democratic pathway, to, uh, towards our unity that we now have the gift of in the Good Friday Agreement, and that's why it's so precious to us and we have yeah. to hold on to it dearly because we know the Tories don't um, pay any regard um, to it. So I think that, you know, that we had a natural transition period, you know, changing out, obviously Martin passing, mm -hmm. you know, Jerry then standing down, myself coming in, Mary Lou coming in, um, and all those things take a bit of time, but I am very proud that we have um, myself and Mary Lou at the helm now and that that's, you know, a good positive image I think to send out to a lot of our activist space but wider to society that you know women are taking up leadership roles in every aspect of life and one of the things that I think is sung about enough actually is that in the north here at this moment in time for the first time ever there's obviously myself as first minister designate there is the attorney general chief justice the head of civil service they're all females that would have been unheard of probably even 10 years ago absolutely so that's a huge transformative change that we're seeing in society and let's see more of it. Absolutely. <laughs> Even just one of those positions, the difference between John Larkin and Brenda King is day, day and night. <laughs> you know, and, and worth pointing out, how's Mary Lou? She's doing great. She's oh, that's doing great. great. Will you send her our best? Because I, I know that people here absolutely love to see her up. She's, and yeah, no, she's got a clean bill of health and she's doing really well and recovering and recuperating. So we'll see her back out in the streets very soon. Oh, that's great. Great news. And so, um, drawn on from that quick discussion there, Actually, there has been an emphasis in Sinn Féin around women members. I noticed a uh, video over the weekend encouraging women to join, talking about their experience of being in a political party. There is something about women being in politics, though it is, but it is stubbornly difficult to get women involved in politics. Would you like to talk just a little bit about that in a very practical way? Yeah, I don't know if anybody or some of you in the room will have seen the video that we launched at the weekend, but it basically was encouraging women to come forward and be activists. So I find my experience personally, um, even trying to get candidates to come forward for council or different roles, you really have to cajole women a wee bit more to, yeah. to step forward. Um, I think that the video reflected what we were trying to say, that um, everybody has a role to play in activism, everybody can be an activist, and the video... Uh, I suppose asked a question of a number of women, some of which are elected, some who work for the party, some who are membership of the party, and asked them why they first got involved. And 
we did that because we want other people to look at it and say oh, that was their motivation that could be that might also be their you know something that they yes. share people come forward because just they're committed to republicans want to see irish unity people come forward because they're activists they've got involved in a particular campaign and want to do more of that people come for, forward for a whole raft of reasons and our party's changing as well you know we are people are coming to join us now that you know perhaps wouldn't have thought of in the past and i think that's a great thing to see we want to grow the party continually and bring more activists on board new skill set you know blend what we've always had in our core support base and just widen up, open up the doors and bring more people in and I think we're doing really well at that actually. Some of the most um, endearing photographs after Martin passed that you'd shared on social media of your own memories were yourself and him with young people and I think there's similar challenges around young people getting involved in politics as well. Yeah I think so it's it's politics needs to reflect the society we live in so that means more women more young people more people from different ethnic minority backgrounds we must reflect that in our politics and we have work to do there too we accept that um i am very proud actually that our assembly team is mm. um, is over 50 percent female so that's a, a good positive stride forward as well but we've work to do i mean we, we absolutely accept we've work to do um but it's a, a an improving picture and, and a good picture yeah in terms Sorry, of you said about young people yes I have put a premium on out and about talking to young people because everything that I'm trying to build is for the future that they're, they're living in. So, you know, a better society, a roof over their head, access to education, a health service that works for them, you know, all these things that we're trying to build is for those young people. So I put a, certainly put a premium on being out and about and engaging with, with ordinary folks, um, but particularly in young people and talking to them about their hopes, their aspirations. Um, convincing them of the merits of constitutional change and yeah. it's going to be them that's going to actually be the, the activist that would be voting for it, who would be out campaigning for it um, and I can tell you young people are enthusiastic about constitutional change and they're very um, enthused about being part of it so I think at the right juncture could you imagine the carnival of, you know, of support, of campaigning for constitutional change but they have to know that it's about them and it's about their future and it's better for them so yeah. I think that's time well worth spent Absolutely, and if you look at the social change referenda that happened in the South, they were led by young people to a very yeah. large extent. You saw yeah. that complexion. And drawn on from that, we see that you have the consensus type of politics, the step change politics in, in the last assembly. Um, and there were those pieces of legislation at the end that you were able to get through despite the challenges that were there. Was there anything you couldn't do? that kind of you're sitting going as soon as I walk in the door this is what I want to do yeah there's a number of things I mean there was things that we got started we didn't get to complete we started some pieces of legislation that we have to come back to I can tell you we've got rings of papers of, <laughs> of pieces of legislation that we want to do um, I'm very passionate that we get um, the strategy to end violence against women and girls over the line um, and that will come under the remit of my office so that's something that I would definitely prioritise from day one um, good work's been done on that to date, but there's more to, to do. But there's so many other things that we want to do. Like One of the things we've been talking about in the past couple of weeks is that at this moment in time, families are worried about how they're going to buy the school uniforms for September. You know, Families are turning to that, that juncture right now. I want to legislate so that we can make school uniforms affordable. You know, Let's help families out. So for yeah. me, ultimately, the priorities when we go back in have to be around the health transformation. It has to be around... Um, creating jobs, it has to be around you know, supporting workers and families and particularly with the cost of living crisis so I made the point earlier that I think that there's so much potential despite the limitations of the Assembly um, I think that we should be trying to continually make it work where we can when we can get partners in which to do so but we've demonstrated that um, progressive politics working together can deliver the goods and I want to do more of that So in the context of that, the term First Minister for All has been coined by yourself and you use it a lot. Was that a natural thing for you to, to, to say that? Um, yeah, well, well, if you take up the role of First Minister, you sign a pledge that you're going to work for everybody right. on the basis of equality and respect. And, um, and I believe in those things. So it was, I think it was a natural um, maybe way to, to say that in an ordinary layman's terms, layman's terms. First Minister for all, and I mean what I say, I will practice what I preach. I believe passionately that if you're going to be in the position of First Minister that you have to work for everybody in society. Um, you know, 
I'm a mummy. I just recently became a mammal. Woo! Yeah, night of life. <laughs> <laughs> and and what I, you know, when I, I still live in the community I was reared in, um, I understand the struggles of workers and families. I see it in my own family, I see it all around me. So what I'm trying to do is to answer some of those things, but because I'm coming at it from the point of view of my own experience, what I want for my children and grandchildren, and I want that for everybody. So yeah. I think that's the kind of, that's the motivation behind the First Minister for All, is to actually demonstrate in word and deed. And I expect it to not just be something that I do, there'll be everybody who's a, look, just got elected in the council or a councillor for everybody in their community as well. So it's just following that right through and actually practising what we preach. Yeah, you do see the people who were um, elected deputy mayors and mayors very quickly using a phrase like, I'm going to be a mayor for all or a deputy yeah. mayor. You, you can see that that was there. Very practical outworking of that. So the day that um, Hugh Edwards is on the BBC and he announces that the Queen has passed, there was obviously immediately kind of thoughts about what was going to happen next. Tell us a little bit about that and about the decisions and the environment, how you felt about that. Well, I mean, it's not, it wouldn't have been the natural territory for a Republican, no. you know, obviously, but um, obviously. Um, but for me, it ultimately it boils down to respect and practicing what I said I would do and fulfilling my promise to, to represent everybody. I mean, I attended because I thought it was the respectful thing to do, that because there are many people in society who look towards the monarchy as, you know, their head of state. That's not, I don't share that view. I have a Republican outlook in life. Um, I don't have to surrender any of that to be respectful to those people in society that do look towards the, the monarchy. So for me, it was about um, fulfilling my promise and my commitment. And, you know, I think it, it really, you could see the response to it in the local elections. You know, the scene with yourself and Alex Maskey is sitting here as well, you know, where you're in Hillsborough. Certainly, it was, it was very different. Well, Alex and I are definitely going to go down in history as the only two Republicans to have attended a Queen's funeral on the King's coronation. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, we, we marked the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, very important, and there were many people involved in marking it in all kinds of different ways. Um, we've talked a little bit about your political journey, but in 1998, can you, can you just tell us a little bit about your memories of the Good Friday Agreement and what arose for you from that? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was um, 20 at the time. Um, I was a young mother, and I can just vividly remember, I suppose, the, the feeling of hope and optimism, um, of, some, of better days ahead. Mm. And I think that... Um, so my daddy was elected at that time. He was a, a councillor in Dungannon Council. And I think he helped me to understand that this was for my generation to take on, um, to take on that button and keep running. Um, and that we had this democratic and peaceful way towards Irish unity. And we need to grab both hands. So from that time, I have been about the peace process. Um, you know, got straight in behind it uh, as an activist. Um, you know, with the party constantly being elected to council, assembly, and everything else that came after that, but uh, I mean, so obviously, basically, all of my adult life has been about from the Good Friday Agreement to, to, to where we are today. So, fully behind it, supporting it, driving it, and like we spent a lot of time in the last number of months um, celebrating what's been achieved in the last 25 years, and it is immense. Like it is really, really immense. Um, when we reflect on the, the the world we lived in in 1998 and where we are today, I mean, we're so grateful for all those people who put in blood, sweat, and tears to actually bring about. Yeah the Good Friday Agreement and bring about an end to conflict and um, that's why we, I said earlier we have to mind it because the Tory government care less for you know our peace process they their behaviour from you know Brexit right through just totally disrespecting the Good Friday Agreement and that's why it's so important that we continue to look internationally to our partners particularly in the US who've been such stalwarts for you know, in protection of the Good Friday Agreement, I believe we wouldn't have got to where we are with the protocol negotiations and everything else had it not been for the United States and the role that they have played in saying to Britain there'll be no trade deal if you, you know, cause any da damage to the Good Friday Agreement. So that's what it means to me. That's what the agreement means to me. And but for me, the last 25 years is, or the the anniversary of the of the event was fantastic. But my whole focus has to be in the next 25 years and where we go from here. 
Um, where do you see us being in 25 years? Because for me, right, my age, it feels like a blink of an eye from, you know, I was chatting with people on the street corners to talk about, well, what do you think? What do you think this is going to be? And it did turn into a bit of a living document. Do you think it will still be the living document in 25 years that it is now? I think it has to be. Um, it's the rule book or the toolkit for how politics right. works here. Um, and we continually look to it whenever things are in political disarray or whatever, I mean, you have to abide by the agreement. Um, as I said, it was so hard won. That's why we have to be so careful of it and, and protect it. And I've no doubt that there are people out there, particularly within political unionism, that would want to rip up the agreement now. Yeah. Because nobody had, I don't think anybody foresaw that in 25 years' time, post the Good Friday Agreement being signed, that we would have had such an historic election result, now twice, local government and the assembly. I mean, this was a day that, you know, my parents or grandparents didn't ever see coming, that the balance of power would shift, that we would be the largest party. Um, I mean, that, that was never supposed to happen. This place wasn't built that way. It was built in that political, um, perpetual political uh, unionist majority. Um, the oppression of the nationalist people, you know, all those things, that experience, the lived experience of so many people here, I have been quite struck by, since the Assembly election and the, again the, the local government election, the amount of people that come up to me and say, I never thought we'd see this day. Yeah. And they can see it and they can feel the change that's in the air. And I think there's an unstoppable change in the air. And we're headed one direction. And when we're heading in this direction towards constitutional change, we need to do the proper planning, do advance you know, the arguments, um, have a mature political discourse um, around this. And I know you want to probably talk about that. Um, I don't mean to jump ahead. but. People are coming up to me constantly saying, "I never thought I'd see this day. Um, this place wasn't supposed. To, this wasn't supposed to happen here, but it has happened." But that demonstrates and speaks to the change that's out there in society. And as you say, it definitely creates a momentum, doesn't it? It does. It does. You know? It creates momentum towards what this next period ahead can look like. Um, you know, if you look at over the next year, over the next eighteen months, a Dáil election, a Westminster election. You know, if we get the assembly up and running. Can we have Sinn Féin First Minister here? Can we have a Sinn Féin Taoiseach in Dublin? Can we have, or will there be, a Labour government in London? You know, so all these things can change, and that can change the whole political dynamic of relationships. And you know, relationships are pretty poor between Britain and Ireland, and I think that there's an opportunity, I think, for maybe a watershed period ahead in terms of relationships on the island, relationships between Ireland and Britain and Europe. Because the one big, um, I think, argument that we have in our favour in terms of constitutional change is that Europe have said, in the event of successful um, unity, ref a referendum on unity, that we will automatically back into Europe with the rest of the island. So that's that's a big prize for a lot of people, and it will be something that will convince people, perhaps, who don't come from a traditional, just Republican, you know, people who are United Irelanders. Yeah, is there a tension between that? Um that really forward-thinking constitutional concept and bringing people back into making the assembly work. Is there a tension between those two kind of concepts, particularly in the context of the assembly being stubbornly down the DUP's position? Well, there's no doubt. I mean, people can see the, the writing on the wall in terms of the, you know, everything that's shifting, all those yeah. political dynamics that are turning. Um, so I have no doubt that... that political unionism are looking towards that um, and what it means for them. But that's why I think it's important that we try to make power share and work. Because right. if we can make, so I don't see any, any contradiction in making power share and work while advocating constitutional change, that's what the Good Friday Agreement in itself says. So I think that um, if we can make power share and work, why can't we make constitutional change work? And why can't we govern ourselves by ourselves with no interference from London um, and do so on the basis of the principles of the Good Friday Agreement were like there has to be continuity and the protections in the Good Friday Agreement are an identity. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that if the Good Friday Agreement maintains its international law, it needs to follow through. So that continuity needs to come from from the Good Friday Agreement into the constitutional change. So I think there's a prize for us all to do something better and to govern together um, in a way that you know is respectful, it's got a quality at its core, building a society that everybody feels valued and part of and I just think that's the big prize for everybody. It's not without challenges at the no, minute. No.
you know, I mean, the the significant challenge of the DUP staying out on on whatever basis, which seems to change a little bit from from day to day. But you know, take a little bit of time about those challenges, whether it's the the Tory bu budgets, whether it's where the DUP base sits. You know, how is that at the minute? Well, it is quite challenging, and I think that there's probably I think there's public patience with the DUPs running out of road. Um, like we're, we're a year and a half post the almost a year and a half post the assembly election we've had the local government election the public have had their say but the DUP are still in this position which they themselves have to take responsibility for putting themselves in um, I mean they're very their behaviour is quite you know chaotic dysfunctional they champion Brexit they have to own them, some of the mess that is now being created as a result of it and they've been off in this boom-bust relationship with the Tories and propping up Theresa May or Boris Johnson and then, you know, continually being kicked to the curb whenever they were no longer useful. Um, but they're very quickly coming to a juncture where they're going to have to decide. Are they going to come in and share power on an equal basis or are they not? Mm. Because they can't continually hide behind the veil of the protocol or Brexit. Or, <coughs> but people don't stop me in the street and ask me, is the DUP not in because of the Brexit or the protocol? They ask me, the DUP are not going in because they don't like the fact that Sinn Féin is the First Minister. And I think, so that's what I think we're quickly getting to the juncture where they have to answer the question, are they prepared to share power on an equal basis? I hope they make the right decision, but I think we will very quickly know that um, over the course of the next few months, certainly. Um, and if it's not to be, and I like to always try to be hopeful and give people hope, and I'm not going to give up, um, I'm determined to try to make it work. Um, I hope that we can get there and if we don't then it's time for the two governments to take action and to work together. Um, I actually agree with the Taoiseach's commentary around. Yeah, it was very interesting what Leo Varadkar said. It, um, really it's only in the past day or so where he's saying the British government are not putting their shoulder to the wheel on this. Yeah, and he said that now twice in the last week so um, I think it's important that he does say those things and, and to call it out. But the two governments have responsibility. They're co-guarantors of the peace agreement so they do have to act jointly. Um, as I said, I'm not going to give up. I've said some of the things that I want to do in a restored assembly. I do think it's where we all should be. Um, but if, if that's not to be, then the two governments need to act in tandem. And the Taoiseach's right in that regard. And the, the British government is punishing local people in the meantime, where you know the, the very heavy hand of austerity is really showing itself now. Big time. And I think the COVID pandemic really demonstrated that Tory austerity decimated public services it meant that we were in a poor state to be able to respond to what was um, a, an emergency so I mean the austerity agenda has crippled public services it's left us in such a difficult position so even if we had an executive up and running tomorrow there's going to be huge challenges on mm, the incoming yeah. minister's desks because of the financial position but that's why I advocate that the parties work together to put the case to the treasury this place isn't funded properly for a start no so there are changes that can be achieved there um, Scotland and Wales have a fiscal framework, they have a different way of being funded. Um, the need that we have here isn't reflected in how we're funded as well. So I actually think we can get some joined up thinking across the parties around this issue. But the British government aren't going to negotiate with us until they know there's going to be a restored executive. So we've been doing some work across the parties around that um, and we'll continue that. But I think if we have, if there is a declaration that um, that we're going back, uh, that the DUP are going to come back in with the rest of us, then we need to quickly turn our heads towards the the negotiation with the Treasury because we need to invest in our in our public services. We also need to do, you know, we need to stabilise things in, in terms of um, the current pressures that we have, and we need to transform things like the health service, for example, yeah. is huge need of huge transformation. And again, these are things that we should be able to work together on, um, but. The, the challenges that we face, the Tory austerity agenda has crippled us for, for such a long time and will continue to do as whilst we're funded in the way in which that we are. Which isn't separate to the big, big constitutional debate that you mentioned earlier. You know, um, In 20 months' time, we'll have had that Westminster election, we'll have had a Leinster House election. The lands political landscape on both our islands could look very different. And in the context of that, really... You know, where there's going to be huge expectations on the potential for a Sinn Féin government on both sides of the border, and that will be firmly on the constitutional settlement. I think so. I mean, I think that 
and particularly in the south, the public are ready for change. They're tired of um, the establishment parties cutting deals and you know serving themselves and not serving the public. Um, they're tired of the fact that the housing crisis is just keeps deepening and you know they're not doing anything about it. So I think the public um, want change and they want to elect Sinn Féin into government. We take nothing for granted. We know we have to work hard at it. Um, we know we need to do that graft on the ground. We need to convince people of what it is that we're offering. But we will fulfil our commitment, particularly around housing, because housing is that big totemic issue that's facing yeah. us in, in the South. And I think that um, we will be the party that will have the plan, that do have the plans to actually do something about it. But obviously, we have to do the graft. We have to stand enough candidates as well. But um, <laughs> we will do that in this election. Um, and because it will come down to seats who forms the, yeah. who forms the government. But I, I think there's a real appetite there. You can see it in the polls where we're steadily... You know, rising in the polls and consolidating the support that has came to us. Um, but we'll keep working hard at it and hopefully that's where we get to. But I said earlier about how sometimes a lot of things can change at once. You could have, you know, a Labour government in, in London. You know, what does that look like um, in terms of relationships? Um, and as I said, we could be the Irish government also. Um, but we know we've got work to do, but uh, we're determined to do it. And so a border poll, planning for a border poll will be at the heart of that. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, we've been advocating for some time that there needs to be a citizens' assembly. Um, this Irish government has not taken that up, um, but a Sinn Féin in government will take that up. We will advance um, the case. You know, I think I envisage that we need to ha get to the point where we have a green paper, we need to have a white paper, we need to have citizens' assembly, we need to have constitutional convention. Mary Lou said publicly before we need to have rolling constitutional conventions around some of these things, but like. Brexit is a good example as to how not to do something. Yeah. I mean, that referendum was head, held in the absence of having you know, proper information and facts for people. Um, so we know we need a lead in time. We know we need to um, do that work, the preparatory work. And it needs to start now. I mean, this should be already underway. I mean, you don't have to look too far around you to find that, that, that the conversation about constitution change is so, you know, it's so um, mainstream now. Yes. You have you know, leading academics labour movement, um, you have people from all walks of life are now entering into the conversation, you know, economists are entering into it, what does the economic structure look like, um, and that's a really, really healthy place for us to be, and nobody should run away or be shy of that debate, now's the time to have it, so the Irish government are behind the curve on this, um, but Sinn Féin and government will ensure that we are not behind the curve on this. And I, I suppose, you know, in this room, people raising um, the border poll or potential thinking out what um, unified things like a health service might be, they're deemed illegitimate in some quarters when it's a completely legitimate mm -hmm. debate and a noble one at the, it, at the it same It is, time. absolutely. I mean, partitions failed everybody who lives on the island, all for different reasons, and people have their own lived experience and their own perspective of it. But there's a huge opportunity ahead of us to do something better. And I'm not talking about just, you know, adding the 6 on to the 26, it has to be like fundamental change. It has to be about re-envisaging um, our, our island. And I think that we have huge opportunity to do something that is just so much more better than what everybody has um, right now. So, But let's do that homework. Let's tell people what the health service could look like, what the education system could look like, what the economy could look like, um, how we'll benefit from, the, from all those things. So I look at it as an opportunity, and I think that... It's actually irresponsible of the Irish government to not have started the preparation in the way in which we would like yeah. to see it right now. And you can really see how failure has filled some of that gap in the multitude of discussions, conversations and experts coming to to chat with us this week and last week. Um, that's there. But we, we can't forget that there's people who will always feel that this debate is not theirs. British citizens who are tied to the union see this debate happening and you know and the the first minister for all you know how how do they tie together well i think you have to and we used the phrase practice what you preach so um people who come from a unionist identity british identity unionist background there are some people out there who will never be convinced of the merits of unification and you think you have to accept that there are also a lot of people out there who are open to being persuaded and i think the things that will persuade people are the things that we do every day mm -hmm. um, the First Minister for all, the respect that you can show, hold through to your own values, but be respectful of people with a different um, outlook. Um, I think all these things are actually persuaders. 
to actually help people whenever it comes to the time that constitutional change is happening because I do believe we're on an inevitable trajectory here but I do think that um, it can be the day to day things that we do for people how we conduct ourselves um, in terms of delivering um, for everybody in society I think that those things will, will help to convince people then whenever we're making the case around constitutional change when we actually have a date for the referendum and, and people are getting ready to, to, to vote but I think that as Republicans we should be generous um, we should try to be find ways to you know ensure that those of a British identity don't in any way feel um, or that, that they know that their position will be respected in the constitutional changed world that we may live in so or that we will live in um, so I think we have, we've worked it out to try to convince people but we need to just do that work away at it every day I think that's really interesting, particularly when we see that there are many parts of the new Ireland as well. You have migrants, you have people, the new Irish that are here, you know, all of that is part of the same conversation of respect, rights. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think very much so. I mean, we have changed, you know, our makeup is different. I make the point that that needs to be reflected in the politics, but that also needs to be, you know, how do we find ways that those of an Irish identity, British identity, new people who've made here their home, People from different ethnic minority backgrounds. How do they all? They have they have a stake yeah. in future constitutional change. So we need to engage everybody on future constitutional change. And that is so positive, and it's so and it's so exciting for many of us. Um, but the DUP just is, is in this negative place at the minute, and you almost I, I certainly sigh when I say <laughs> DUP by comparison to the excitement that's in this. Yeah, but the DUP are going to do what they do. Um, they're never going to have a, a different perspective on constitutional change. But we should speak to ordinary people out there. Um, the DUP are, the politi are political unionism. There are many people out there from unionist background who again stop me regularly when I'm out and about. And they mightn't be in that space yet where they're convinced about constitutional change. But I think if we keep serving everybody equally, if we keep you know, having their backs, when it comes to the day-to-day -day things that they're worried about, then we, those people are open to being convinced about change in the future. So like that has to be where we're focused on, um, reaching beyond the political class and speaking to ordinary, ordinary citizens. We've had our own um, assemblies, people's yeah. assemblies, and like hundreds of people are coming to those events. Some are curious, you know, some want to pose some questions. But even the panellists, people that have taken part, they're coming from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life. So that's exactly what you want. That's exactly what we want to see. That positive conversation. Everybody's got something to add to the debate, and everybody comes at it from their own perspective. Um, so we find them as very positive um, events, and like really are getting a lot out of it. But that's what we need in a very organised, planned, you know, systematic way from the Irish government to have that type of engagement with with the wider public. Um, but yeah, we have to just find ways to talk to ordinary people. Yeah, and I think that that will be the the game changer. It feels very bottom up at the minute, you know, and we also have to protect those who are engaging in the conversation too. We can, we've seen attacks on some people who engage in it, um, you know, and it was interesting that Michael D. Higgins recognised Colin Harvey, for instance, onto the, the Irish um, Human Rights Commission as, as, I don't know if that was a response or whatever, but it certainly sent a message. It did send a message. I mean, he's an academic, you know, academic freedom. He should be able to express his own political view um, and not be attacked and, and he was absolutely attacked on a consistent basis and have many others who've entered into the conversation that's not acceptable that's not good enough um, people are entitled to hold their legitimate political view They're, the good friday agreement accepts that that we come that we have different views and it'll only be the people that ultimately that will decide constitutional change so um i condemn anybody that attacks people for entering into the conversation and i commend anybody that's, that you know comes forward to get into the conversation for perhaps haven't done it previously but again you know that because you're on many platforms you can see more and more people are entering into this absolutely debate. Um, yeah. and that's we just need to keep replicating that over and over and that's what makes it exciting because it wouldn't it be terrible if we were only talking to ourselves you know yes. having everyone um, engaged in this and provide new questions that come at you sideways absolutely. is just part of the the joy of the debate um, and, and of course we're sitting here and um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about legacy if that was okay you know because that is certainly one of the things that um, is 
very, very pressing at the moment. Do you see any indication that the British government are going to change tack on the legislation? Unfortunately not. Um, I believe they're going to move to final stage of the legislation on the 6th of September, yeah. which will be the end point. Um, and, I mean, we all know what their motivation is here. Their motivation is to cover up their role in the conflict, and there's no other motivation behind it, only that. It does nothing to serve the needs of victims. It does nothing to serve um, the job of work that we have to do around reconciliation and healing. Um, so it serves, you know, it's roundly rejected, both by all the political parties, human rights organisations, um, the legal profession is fundamentally flawed on every level, um, and I will be putting it again, as we have done previously, to the Irish government that they will have to take an interstate case as needs to go to the European Court um, as soon as they bring it to the final stage. And I hope that, that I hope that's a, a very quick response from the Irish government in terms of what happens next. I, mean, I think yesterday's news of the Attorney General opening up the inquest into uh, the UVF murders, I think that shows that you know st these things still can persuade pers or proceed we still can get the fresh inquest opened up but the british government are just trying to close the shutter on absolutely everything um and it's absolutely shame shameful shameful their approach but ultimately it's about covering up their dirty role in the conflict the fact that they were here um and murdered our citizens absolutely <laughs> And it, it would be an awful backdrop to all of the positive potential that is that you've already outlined with restoration of institutions, a border poll, to have this in the background which is sitting so outside of the Good Friday Agreement would be absolutely awful. But without finishing on a negative note, so the next few weeks are going to be intense for you, you know. Um, do, do you th there's all kinds of talk about October, there'll be restoration in October. What, what, what's your gut? That's a big question, on. <laughs> 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 um, I think that if it's, if it's going to, if the executive is going to be restored, I think we're talking about September, October. I think beyond that, as I said earlier, I think the public patience runs out. But the DUP are chaotic. Um, I don't know if they've even worked out what they intend to do. But ultimately, you know, payback, Brexit, protocol, winter framework, all of that noise, peel that all back. This boils down to the one question, are the DUP prepared to share power on an equal basis? That's the one fundamental question that they need to answer. And if they're saying no to that question, then, you know, we're into a whole new yeah. conversation. But I certainly would be um, advocating that there needs to be a joint approach in some form. But to leave it on a positive, I hope that they can get to the right point. Um, I hope that we get a restored executive. I hope I get the chance to be a First Minister for all. I hope that we get the chance to deliver on all the things that we've promised to the public that we will. I hope we get the chance to be to have people's backs, fight their corner, you know, take on the Treasury, do all the things that we want to do. Um, and I hope that we get the chance to show the power sharing can work. Because for me, in the longer term, that says that it, in a constitutional change position, it also can work and we can govern by ourselves. So I'll leave it on that hopeful note that I hope that that's what we can get to. Thank you so much.